You did. <coughs> the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello again. Welcome to tonight's webinar on behalf of EBFA or the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. Thank you guys all for tuning in and taking the time out of your um, busy schedules to listen in on a topic which I think is um, very important and something that we all encounter in both podiatry and um, the fitness industry, but not a lot of people take the time to consider some of the common stretches that we have our clients and our patients do and maybe some of the possible negative impact that we may be having on their foot and ankle function. So um, again, my name is Dr. Melissa Flick. I'm a podiatrist, human movement specialist in New York City, and I'm the founder of EBFA. We do a webinar the first Thursday of every month, so mark your calendars. All of them are recorded and archived on the EBFA website, ebfafitness.com. Um, this one is a little bit shorter, it's probably around 15 minutes, and then you guys can ask any questions that you may have on this topic or anything that relates to foot and ankle function and um, fitness. So as we get started, so we're going to start exploring the importance of this topic and why I thought it would be something that would be interesting to bring up in an EBFA webinar has to do with the prevalence of overpronation in the population. So again, overpronation is very common in clients. It's associated with hip flexor dominance, weak, weak hip external rotators, decreased ankle mobility, hypermobility or genuine valgum. So again, there are a lot of compensations that lead to this overpronated foot type. Um, there's a strong biomechanical impact associated when a client or athlete overpronates during gait. So they get this increase in knee valgus. We all know that knee valgus is associated with, with medial knee pain. Uh, overpronation during gait is associated with decreased power output during gait. So if somebody is overpronating as they walk and they cannot resupinate in time, they're going to have a decreased propulsive phase. They're going to start shutting down their glutes. They're going to start breaking down the inside of their foot, and then they can start getting hypermobility and bunions. So there's a strong deforming force behind overpronation during gait. So a lot of the key components that we're going to see in an overpronated foot type is limited ankle mobility. And why we want to be looking at this topic and considering it is because everything we do should have an evidence-based approach. We want to increase our results decrease our risk of injury by taking that evidence-based approach. So in the overpronated foot, we're going to be targeting specifically the gastrocnemius. So overpronated foot, what is an overpronated foot? When I travel around and I do my lectures, I try and teach fitness professionals to look at a foot by breaking it down into the three planes. So we have the frontal plane, transverse plane, and sagittal plane. If we start by looking at the frontal plane, which is looking straight down behind in the posterior view, we have our Achilles tendon running down as it inserts into the calcaneus. So this is telling me what my foot's subtalar joint is doing. So we can see in this overpronated foot type that the heel is everted. So frontal plane, we're seeing calcaneal eversion, which is the first part of pronation. Eversion. Then we're going into our transverse plane. So the transverse plane, we're looking for abduction. So again, abduction here, if we look down at this foot, we can see abduction of the forefoot as it relates to the rear foot. And in this specific client or patient, we can see that the right foot is abducted a little bit more than the left side. Transverse plane abduction, that's the second component of pronation, that triplanar motion pronation. Last plane we're going to look at is the sagittal plane. And when you assess a foot in a closed chain, the, set, the sagittal plane, excuse me, is going to be your arch height. So here we have a decreased arch height. That will be sagittal plane assessment. 
Again, pronation, we want to remember, is dorsiflexion, abduction, and eversion all at the same time or statically when you're looking at a foot, you're going to see those three motions. Okay, so again, that's our static closed chain assessment of the overpronated foot. Then we got to start looking at that overpronated foot in the open chain. When we look at open chain assessments of any foot type, we're looking at mobility, flexibility. How much range of motion do I have in each joint? If we're going to look specifically at the ankle, and why we look at the ankle in an overpronated foot type is because this is one of the compensations for ankle hypomobility, midfoot pronation. So you're assessing your client. We need at least 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion for optimal gait. Again, ankle dorsiflexion, we need at least 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion when you assess your clients, you want to do it with both a straight leg and a bent leg. So this picture on the bottom, they're assessing with the knee bent, which if you get an increase in ankle dorsiflexion when you bend that knee, we know that that gastrocnemius is tight, which is associated with that overpronated foot. Compensations for limited ankle dorsiflexion, right? We have knee hyperextension which is going to throw those femurs upward toward our head. That's going to shift the pelvis forward into an anterior pelvic tilt, which means we're going to get increased lordosis. We're then going to get midfoot pronation. That's another compensation for decreased ankle mo mobility. We're going to see going an to early heel lift. That early heel lift is, means I'm going to decrease the amount of power I get out of each step I take. So right here, this image on the top, this is a very important image. This is showing a rotation of my Achilles tendon. So again, the image down here on the bottom is showing the rotation of my Achilles tendon as it inserts into my heel. So this, this kind of sagittal cut of my Achilles tendon on the bottom is a cut of my left foot Achilles tendon. And what's interesting is that right here, this number two, this gray area, that's actually my soleus muscle tendon, which is running down here and it's inserting on the inside of my foot. This area right here, the white kind of all the way around here, one, three, and four, that's actually my gastrocnemius muscle tendon. So again, as, as much as we think that the, the gastroc and the soleus are one muscle, they kind of join into that Achilles tendon, they're actually not inter, intertwined into one tendon. They're separate. They're two separate acting muscles that, yes, they're together and they're associated, but on the inside of my heel, that's my soleus. On the outside of my heel, that's actually my gastrocnemius. So, if we're thinking about the overpronated foot, tight, tight ankle or limited ankle joint range of motion, right, and we see them standing here, you can almost imagine how my gastrocnemius is put in a shortened position. So as I stand here, gastrocnemius is out on the outside of my heel. It's in a shortened position in that overpronated foot. So again, starting here that we had limited ankle mobility. I have a client, I do my assessment, I see that they have less than 10 degrees ankle joint range of motion, I have them bend their knee, I get an increase in ankle joint range of motion so I know that their gastrocnemius is tight. Right? Then they're standing here, this is showing me that their gastrocnemius is getting even tighter as they stand in that closed chain position. If I have limited ankle mobility, I'm going to compensate by pronating. So that means my initial problem was tight calves. I had tight calves, I couldn't get over my ankle, so I pronated as a compensation. I kept, kept pronating and now several years down the road, my pronation is leading to even tighter gastrocnemius. So it's part of that initial deforming force and then eventually it becomes part of that pronated foot type. So we do our assessment. We see that they have tight gastrocnemius. What are we going to have them do? We're going to tell them to stretch. 
one of the most common stretches that as podiatrists we learned is that wall stretch. Drop your heel, close chain, calf stretching, drop that heel down. This is the gold standard to increasing any type of joint mobility is stretching. But in that overpronated foot type, are you even stretching your gastrocnemius? So there was a study that was done, and there are multiple studies, but this is one study I pulled, was done in 2009 by Young. And what they did is they evaluated 30 patients. 15 of those patients had a neutral foot. 15 of the patients had a foot like this image on the right. They did a stretch with both relaxed calcaneostats, and then they did another stretch with the orthotics. Okay, so again, this would be the one on the right, this would be how they would stretch first. Then they put them in their orthotics and they stretched them again. And they did a comparison to see what is the difference. When I don't have my orthotics and I'm sitting in this relaxed calcaneal stance, am I even stretching my gastrocnemius? And guess what? You're not. So they found a significant difference between stretching in that overpronated foot and stretching once your foot was corrected. So again, if you are stretching in this position and you're not stretching your gastrocnemius, which that study just showed, then what tendon or muscle are you stretching? Interestingly, you are stretching your posterior tibialis. And when you consider a patient or a client with an overpronated foot type, their posterior tibialis is usually elongated, dysfunctional, and degenerated. So when you approach this type of client or patient, you really do not want to be doing closed chain, relaxed calcaneous position stretching. One, because you're not even stretching the gastrocnemius, but even more important is two, you are possibly damaging this very friable tendon every time you stretch your ankle. So the goal is to either better position that foot or choose a different technique because we must protect this tendon. So what are our other options? So our options are either, like I had said, do a closed chain calf stretch in your orthotics. Get your clients, get your patients to wear that orthotics every single time they do their calf stretching if they have an overpronated foot. When I send a patient to physical therapy and they're doing ankle mobility exercises and stretches, I indicate that that patient must be in their orthotics so they have proper alignment when they stretch their calves. Otherwise, you could imagine how much damage they could be doing to that posterior tibialis tendon. Second option is open chain calf stretching. This means that either you, the client, or the patient has to put that foot in a neutral position and then stretch. Right? So this is an example of open chain. Again, you want to make sure that that foot is neutral so you're not collapsing in and putting any stress on that posterior tibialis. The final option and one option that I strongly believe in and have done a lot of research and have a lot of patients and clients use is myofascial trigger point release, specifically myofascial compression technique. So again, myofascial compression technique, this was created by Trigger Point Performance. And it is a technique similar to ART that you're putting compression under the muscle fibers and then moving the joint through a range of motion. So again, you're compressing the muscle fibers, you're moving the joint through a range of motion, and there's a lot of study behind trigger points and immediate effect on increase in range of motion. So, again, myofascial compression technique, I've done a lot of research with this, I have patients use it, clients use it, and it's addressing the actual cause of hypomobility, which oftentimes is trigger points and adhesions. So again, we're taking this evidence-based approach, we want to reduce any harm that we could be doing to our patients and our clients and start using some more effective techniques. So in summary, as we look at our clients and considerations is any client that you have, you do the assessment, you see they have an overpronated foot type, right? You then need to do an assessment for ankle mobility. When you do that ankle mobility assessment, you must determine is there gastrocnemius type 
or is their soleus tight? Most often you will see that their gastrocnemius is tight for the reasons that I had indicated. If you see that that gastrocnemius is tight, then you must either put them in their orthotics when you're stretching, doing open chain stretching, or even better than those two options is doing myofascial compression technique to the gastrocnemius. So, if you have any questions, please let me know. If you want that article by Young, I can send that to you. Send me an email to dremily at ebfafitness.com. Again, dremily at ebfafitness.com. I can send you that article from Young where they went through the study and um, you can read what they did and kind of the results that they got. If you are interested in learning more about myofascial compression technique, please visit Trigger Point Performance Therapy. Their website is tptherapy.com. They have some great products. If you're interested in learning more on the foot and ankle corrective exercise techniques as it factors in um, foot types, foot assessments, and closed chain mechanics, we have the Barefoot Training Specialist Program. Our next one is going to be June 30th in Miami. And we have a special uh, webinar coming up in a couple weeks where we are partnering with Dr. Perry Nicholson of Stop Chasing Pain. And we are going to be exploring muscle activation uh, programming from the foot to the hip. So again, any questions, please let me know if you want any of the PowerPoints please email me as well.